Very good morning, all of you. I am Dr. M. C. Nataraja. I welcome all my students to session five. So this is a subject uh, in connection with design of steel structural elements, 18 CV 61, offered by Vishveshwarya Technological University for the students of sixth semester under the choice based credit system. and the outcome based education well my dear friends in the last class i was discussing about the different types of loads and their combinations and also i have introduced to the different uh, loading standards part 1 part 2 part 3 part 4 part 5 in connection with uh, different types of loads uh, that are to be considered in the analysis and design of steel structures today let us say what the definition of uh, loads in general in steel structure loads are also referred to as actions what the code says about actions the actions to be considered in design include direct actions experienced by the structure due to self aid external actions etc and imposed deformations such as that due to temperature and settlement whatever the loads uh, we have discussed uh, as per the loading standard in the previous uh, session they are all considered uh, as the loads in fact they are all the characteristic loads which i will be discussing uh, in few minutes self weight is uh, one load that has to be considered in the design and of course you also have the external actions external loads it could be the imposed load wind load earthquake load and there are many external actions uh, leading to stress on a structure all these things are to be considered in the analysis in general so these are referred to as the loads or the actions how these uh, loads are classified so the loads are classified as permanent actions variable actions accidental actions So, what are these permanent actions? Actions due to self-aid of a structural or a non-structural components, fittings, auxiliaries, and fixed equipments, etc., are referred to as the permanent actions. So, permanent action is nothing but the permanent load that are to be considered in the analysis. The second classification is the variable actions or the variable loads. Actions due to construction. and service stage loads such as imposed loads crane loads no loads etc wind loads and earthquake loads so the imposed load is also referred to as the live load and finally we have the last classification accidental actions actions due to explosions and impact of vehicles etc all these things we have discussed uh, looking to the information that is available in the code of practices the loading standard is 875 so let us introduce to two important uh, concepts characteristic action and the design action characteristic action or the characteristic load how the is 800 is defining the characteristic actions qc or the values of the different actions that are not expected to be exceeded with more than 5% probability during the life of the structure and they are taken as the self weight in most cases calculated based on is 875 part 1 which includes uh, the loads calculated based on the nominal dimensions and the unit weight of the materials the variable loads the value specified in the relevant code are to be used in fact we have the other uh, standards is 875 part 2 3 4 and so on the characteristic action if you see here what the code says is that load should have the probability of occurrence to the extent of about 95% if at all there is any probability with which the load considered in the design is going to be exceeded it can happen to the extent of about 5% the exceedance should not be more than 5% as a probability 
and that particular load is referred to as the characteristic load or the characteristic actions. Here we need to take the summations of the different actions because we are not just designing the structure for one single load. So we have the dead load and also we have the different loads that are to be considered as combinations and depending on what combinations of the load we will be considering accordingly we need to use the safety factors also. So that is the reason so the characteristic load is nothing but the various loads that are to be considered in the analysis. Now once you have the concept of characteristic loads so what the loads uh, that are uh, discussed and made available in the course of practices they are all the characteristic loads. So when you are designing a structure the characteristic load what you get from the code need to be increased. So that is where the amplification of the load comes into picture. The amplified load the load that is increased from the point of analysis is referred to as the design load or the design loads when you have the combinations and they are also called as the design actions and this is given by QD Q means uh, load D for design so that is equal to summational effect of gamma FK and QCK so QCK is nothing but the characteristic load and its definition we have seen in the previous slide and the information on the characteristic load you get from the course of practices what is this uh, gamma FK? The gamma FK is the partial safety factor for loads and these partial safety factors are used to account for the many uncertainties that will arise during the process of calculation of the load or during the process of identification of the load and its effects. Many a times it is extremely difficult to calculate the load very precisely and there are many assumptions uh, that are used in the calculation and also the effect of the load on the structure may not be 100% as we consider in the analysis. And there is a possibility that these effects can change marginally. And these effects which causes the change are referred to as the uncertainties. What these uncertainties are? So we have the possibility of the unfavorable deviation of the loads from the characteristic value that can happen. Possibility of inaccurate assessment of the load can also happen. The uncertainty in the assessment of the effects of the load is another thing that causes variation. Uncertainty in the assessment of the limit state being considered. So in all these things uh, we are not 100% certain. So there is a uncertainty as far as these factors are concerned. Obviously the load what we calculate as characteristic load may not be perfect. So that is the reason we need to design for a load which is in excess of the characteristic load. So that the design what we do is 100% safe from the point of acceptability. And these amplification factors as far as the loads are concerned is referred to as the partial safety factor. In fact uh, this safety factor is applied not only for the calculation of the load and we also need to apply the safety factor even for the determination of the strength of the material. So the safety factor for the load and safety factor for the strength both are to be considered in the limit state. So that is the reason the failure of the structure not only due to the exceedance of the load and it is also due to the strength of the material not existing to the expected level due to certain uncertainties with regard to strength. So that is the reason. So partially we need to apply the safety factor once for the load and of course for the strength of the material as well which we will be discussing later. Now as far as the design load is concerned the partial safety factor is always be more than one except in special situations it can be slightly less than one so which will be discussed in a short while from now. We also have the partial safety factor for the strength which I will be discussing later. So which is also a factor more than one but the actual strength of the material need to be divided by the partial safety factor so that 
we can underestimate the strength of the material. So as for the design action is concerned, the partial safety factor, gamma FCK, again it depends on what type of load and what combinations of load and all these things are available in IS875. I have taken a small uh, piece of information from the table available in IS875. Uh, partial safety factor for the loads gamma F for the limit state of collapse. In fact, we have two limit states. One is uh, limit state of collapse that is from the point of estimation of the limiting strength and also we have the limit state of serviceability. What the table I am presenting here is with respect to limit state of collapse. Now what different combinations of the load that you will be considering? If you are analyzing only for the dead load, there is no combination, it is an individual load. The characteristic dead load need to be multiplied by 1.5, so straight away we will get the design load. But when you go for the combinations, so these are all some of the combinations being discussed in uh, IS875. Now kindly say this, this is a combination of the dead load, live load and the crane load. So live load we have seen in the design of slabs in uh, RCC and we take about uh, 2 kN per meter square or 3 kN per meter square based on the type of the occupancy. So that value we will be taking it in steel also. But in the design of steel structure where there is a provision for the crane in an industrial building, the load resulting from the movement of the crane is considered as an imposed load. And there are two types of crane loads. One is acting in the vertical direction and another is acting in the lateral direction. So both the imposed load here is LL. One is from the type of the occupancy, another is resulting from the crane load. Whether it is LL or CL. So we need to use the appropriate factors depending on the importance of the load and the maximum effect uh, what this imposed load is causing. That you will be able to appreciate from this uh, table. Now as far as the dead load is concerned here in this combination, we need to increase the dead load, whatever you have calculated from the size of the component by 1.5. Now as far as the live load is concerned, the imposed load is concerned, so that imposed load need to be multiplied with 1.5 and that is referred to as the leading imposed load or the leading live load. Now as far as the crane load is concerned, the amplification factor is 1.05. So you have to ask a question when we need to use 1.5 and when we need to use 1.05. So if the effect of the load is maximum and if that maximum imposed load need to be multiplied by 1.5 and of course the one which is not so serious, not so effective compared to the leading load, the main load. So that load need to be multiplied with 1.05. So many of these things are discussed in IS875. A similar type of table you will be able to see. And at the bottom of the table, so there are different points being discussed under note. And when you read those notes, you will be able to make out what the importance is of these different types of imposed loads. Now when you take the combination, the second one, dead load, live load, crane load, the third one is either the wind load or the earthquake load. So as I mentioned, so both will not be considered simultaneously. What is the first uh, partial safety factor? As far as the dead load is concerned, it is uh, 1.2. As far as the imposed load, the leading imposed load is concerned, it is uh, 1.2. And as far as the Accompanying live load is concerned, it is 1.05. And what is this 0.6? So the 0.6 is the factor which is to be applied onto either the wind load or the earthquake load. So kindly see here, the wind load or the earthquake load is reduced by a factor 0.6 because we have a combinations of other loads coming into picture. Now kindly see here in the first combination it is 1.5 and 1.5 but when you take the combination of the wind load or the earthquake load so the value of the partial safety factor for the dead load and live load will be reduced to 1.2 from 1.5.
because already we have a significant effect of either the wind load or the earthquake load coming into picture. So that is a huge load in addition to dead load and imposite load. When the wind load itself is quite huge, quite large, so there is no point in uh, increasing the dead load and imposite load by 50%. We need to increase it, but a small percentage of increase to the extent of about 20% is permitted by the code. So we also have one more uh, uh, set of partial safety factors for the same combination of the load. So we have already exercised 1.1.2 as far as dead load and leading imposed load is concerned. So even for the second combination, we have the same value of 1.2, but for the accompanying live load, it is not 1.05, it is 0.53. But as far as the wind load or the earthquake load is concerned, so we need to multiply with 1.2. So what is the difference uh, as far as the first set of values and the second set of values in the rows are concerned? Now for this particular combination, so we are not changing the partial safety factor for dead load and the leading live load, but for the accompanying live load it is 1.05 and for the wind load or the earthquake load it is 0.6. So that is the first combination as far as the accompanying live load and the wind load or earthquake is concerned. But in the second time, so we are changing the partial safety, safety factor in such a way that the accompanying live load is reduced substantially almost by 50%. So that is where the factor 1.05 is reduced to 0.53. But on the other hand, the partial safety factor for the effect of wind load or the earthquake load is almost doubled. So 0.6 is becoming 1.0 where the partial safety factor is almost doubled as far as the wind and earthquake is concerned. But whereas the live load which is accompanying in nature the value of the partial safety factor is almost reduced by 50%. So 50% reduction in this uh, partial safety factor and 50% increase in this partial safety factor is applied so that we have the second set of partial safety factors for the same combination of dead load, live load, crane load, wind load or the earthquake load. Now if you take the third combination, so you have the dead load and of course uh, the Next load is uh, either the wind load or the earthquake load. As for the dead load is concerned for this combination, it is 1.5 where you are amplifying the characteristic load by 50%. But under the wind load or the earthquake load, again it is 1.5. So 50% amplification is done to get the design load as far as this combination of loads are concerned. But when you are checking the design for the stability, stability against overturning, so instead of uh, multiplying the characteristic dead load by 1.5, we are multiplying that by 0.9. So we are actually considering the uh, working load or slightly a lesser value of the working load rather than the ultimate load in case of stability check. So this is what the point uh, you need to remember. When you take the next combination of dead load and the erection load, it is 1.2 for the dead load and 1.2 for the erection load. So here the erection load is also sometimes referred to as the imposed load. But of course uh, in the stability calculations as I mentioned, so 1.2 is reduced to 0.9. Now if we take the last combination, dead load, live load and the accidental load. So when you consider the accidental load, many a times the accidental loads are huge loads. So in such situation, the entire accidental load as a characteristic value is considered. Obviously, the partial safety factor for the accidental load is taken as 1. But when the accidental load itself is uh, quite considerable, so there is no point in increasing the other loads substantially. As for the dead load is concerned, it is taken as 1. The same characteristic value we take it as design value, but the leading live load is reduced substantially where only 35% of the actual live load is being considered. Actual dead load without any partial safety factor and the leading imposed load reduced to 35% and of course all the accidental load as a characteristic value what we will be considering what we, will, what we have calculated will be considered as the load. The entire load will become the design load 
from the point of analysis and design. Now you see the second uh, table, very similar to the first table, but this is the partial safety factor for the load for the limit state of serviceability. Kindly see here the values are either 1 or slightly less than 1. What is the indication? Whenever we are designing, we are amplifying the load by about 50% or maybe by some value depending on the combinations of the load. For the higher loads, we are designing and ensuring the safety to see that there is no failure when the actual loads are acting on the structure. But when you are checking for the serviceability, for example, when you want to determine the deflection of a beam, we are interested in knowing how the beam is performing in the working condition during the service condition when certain load is acting on the structure. So that is what the working load. So you have to consider the maximum possible value of the working load as determined from the calculation. So that is the reason we are not increasing the characteristic value of the load that is being used in the design and hence the partial safety factor is just 1. If you amplify it, then the deflection is determined for the ultimate condition. So there is no point in determining the deflection corresponding to the ultimate condition where the structure is at the verge of collapse. What is important is to know the serviceability when the structure is really performing the intended function. So that is where the characteristic values are not going to be amplified. So characteristic value will become the design value. Thus the partial safety factor for loads for limit state of serviceability for the combination of dead load, live load and grain load is just 1, 1, 1. But if you have the earthquake load or the wind load in addition to the first three, then the values will be different. Of course, one for the dead load, but in all the cases of live load, either the leading or the accompanying, it is 0.8. And of course, for the wind load or the earthquake load, it is again 0.8. So when you have the combination of dead load plus either the wind load or the uh, earthquake load, it is one for the dead load and of course, one for the wind load or the earthquake load means we are not amplifying the load as far as the serviceability values are concerned. Dead load plus erection load, dead load plus live load plus accidental load is generally not considered as a part of limit state of serviceability. So these two are considered as a part of limit state of strength or the limit state of collapse. What is this characteristic strength? So we have discussed about the load. Now let us see what the strength of the material is, which is the strength of steel, how characteristically the strength is being defined. The ultimate strength calculation may require consideration of loss of equilibrium of the structure or any part of it considered as a rigid body. This is what uh, the assumption. Failure by excessive deformation, rupture, or loss of stability of the structure or any part of it including support and foundation. Characteristic strength is that strength below which not more than 5% results fall. Suppose if you have certain strength say 250 mega Pascal as a yield stress. So you will be procuring the material ensuring that the strength is 250 or it can be more than 250 mega Pascal also. Since it is a manufactured material, there is a very possibility that the strength can even go below 250 mega Pascal. So you have to take a sample and test it in the laboratory. So you can't simply take one sample and test and see what the strength is. Generally, the strength may be more than 250 mega Pascal, but sometimes the strength can also be less. So that is the reason when we are calculating this characteristic value, either the load, what I discussed earlier, or even the characteristic strength, we need to take certain minimum number of samples. As I mentioned in one of the earlier classes, we need to take a minimum of 30 samples. Large sample analysis comes into picture. In fact, I will explain one particular set of calculations as to how the characteristic strength and the characteristic load can be determined from the data of 30 sample results. 
The characteristic strength as I mentioned, it is the strength below which not more than 5% of the results false means 95% of the result should have a value equal to the expected strength or more than that expected strength. If the expected strength is 250, so 95% of the samples should have the strength more than 250. If at all there is a scope for certain number of samples not to have that strength, that can only be to the extent of 5%. So once you calculate the characteristic strength, so we can calculate the design strength. So design strength is what the value we actually use in the design. The design strength SD is defined as SU, where SU is uh, the ultimate strength of the material, which is the characteristic ultimate strength. And that need to be divided by partial safety factor for materials that is represented as gamma M. So I need to reduce the strength so that that will become the design strength from the characteristic strength. So when you have a characteristic strength of 250 megapascal or 300 megapascal or 400 megapascal as a yield strength, what the strength that need to be considered in the design? Taking all those uncertainties, what we discussed in the load, here also we have set of uncertainties that can cause a reduction in the strength. So that is the reason the factor what I am going to use is such that I am going to get a lesser value as far as the design strength is concerned from the characteristic value. But here the factor what I am going to use is not the multiplication factor, it is the division factor. With the division factor, I need to get a value which is less than SU, which is the design strength. To decrease the value of SU, the characteristic strength, since I am dividing, so the factor is always be greater than 1, so that the characteristic strength will be reduced suitably so as to get the design strength. So why we need to reduce the characteristic strength to get the design strength is only to account for certain uncertainties which is likely to decrease the strength of the material. What these uncertainties are? Number 1. The possibility of an unfavorable deviation of the material strength from the characteristic value is always be there because it is a manufactured material. When you are manufacturing, there could be a lot of changes that can happen. So obviously, change in the strength occurs. If that changes onto the positive side, of course it is an advantageous thing. But by chance, if it is onto the negative side, so the strength what we use in the design will be definitely be less but we are using the actual designated strength which is on to the higher side so there is a very possibility that the structure can undergo failure where the strength of the material is underestimated the possibility of an unfavorable variation in the material sizes can also happen suppose if you are manufacturing a rod the diameter of the rod may be 10 mm so what is the guarantee that the diameter is exactly 10 mm it may be slightly more or it can be slightly less. By chance if it is slightly less, then there is a problem. So to take care of that uncertainty where the size can be slightly less, so we have this partial safety factor. And also the uniformity of the bar. What is the guarantee that the uniformity of the bar is constant throughout? And also the composition also can vary. So since it is a manufactured material, there is not much of a scope for variation in the composition because it is a steel being manufactured under strict quality control. But when you take concrete, so there is a very possibility that the change can happen. So that is the reason the partial safety factor in case of concrete is slightly onto the higher side than the factor applied to steel as a material. The possibility of unfavorable reduction in the member strength due to fabrication and tolerances. So there are a lot of changes that can happen in fabrication. We need to have a precision cutting. We need to weld it properly. The temperature has to be controlled. And of course, we need to maintain certain tolerances when many of these things goes beyond the limit. So there is a very possibility that the member strength can go down. Uncertainty in the calculation of the strength of the member itself. How the strength of steel is being calculated. Of course, we need to conduct a test in the laboratory. So what is the guarantee that the instrument is really performing good? 
So there may be some variation because of the continuous usage. So there are uncertainty factors coming into picture. So when you are estimating the strength. So to take care of these probable variations that can cause reduction in strength. So we need to decrease the characteristic strength of the material by certain value. To get that we need to use the partial safety factor gamma m which is more than one as a division factor applied on to the characteristic strength. Now kindly see the table of partial safety factor for the material gamma m. So we have uh, uh, the design especially in the uh, tension members where the strength, strength means the resistance, if it is governed by the yielding of the member, then the factor is referred to as gamma MO. So kindly see this one, this is gamma MO. So this factor is taken as 1.10. If you are determining the resistance of the member to buckling, then also the factor is referred to as 1.10 gamma MO. But if you are determining the resistance which is governed by the ultimate strength or the ultimate stress of the material, then the factor is referred to as gamma M1 and that value is 1.25. So what is important is when you want the resistance with respect to yielding and buckling, the partial safety factor is 1.1 where the actual characteristic strength of the material is divided by 1.1 so that you are going to get the lesser value which is the design strength approximately the value what you are going to get with this 1 upon 1.1 it is 0.9 very close to 0.9 so 10 percent of reduction in the characteristic value is exercised when you are determining the design strength as far as the resistance against yielding or the resistance against buckling is considered but when you want the resistance when it is governed by the ultimate strength of the material then it is 1.2 25. So 1 upon 1.25 if you calculate then that becomes the reduction factor. The actual characteristic strength is reduced by that much. Now if you take uh, the fabrications of uh, the steel especially the shaft fabrication where bolts are used or even the welds are used and you can also use the rivets and you can also have the field fabrication. Means that the fabrication that is happening in the field we go to the site and we do the fabrication and where it is really difficult to exercise precise the quality control and good quality control many a times not possible because of various reasons that will have an effect practically but when you are doing the fabrication in a shop obviously it is possible to have good control over the fabrication if this is what the situation what is the partial safety factor the partial safety factor is more or less same whether it is a shaft fabrication or a field fabrication it is always be 1.25 not only for the bolts and even for the rivets and of course for the welds also except in one case of a field fabrication as you can see here that too for the weld. So what students need to remember is the partial safety factor in case of connection design whether it is a bolt or a rivet or a weld. It is always be 1.25 but when you are doing the design by welding that too when the weld is field fabrication weld it is 1.5 so the partial safety factor will become 1.5 only in case of welds that too if the welding is done in the field obviously it is a field fabrication welding partial safety factor is 1.5 otherwise in all cases of connection it is 1.25 now what are the factors governing the ultimate strength of the material? Stability. So stability shall be ensured for the structure as a whole and sometimes uh, for each of the elements of the structure. So if you are considering an industrial building, the stability of the industrial building as a whole is uh, one aspect and the stability of the individual component. So where the individual component can be the portal frame or it can be the mill bed or it can be the truss part of the building individually that element also should be stable stability against overturning so this is where uh, important aspects in many types of industrial buildings comes into picture the structure as a whole or any part of the structure shall be designed to prevent instability to overturning uplift or sliding under the factor load 
so when you take the amplification effect of the load and when you analyze the structure from the point of stability so the structure should be safe so there should not be any overturning happening and there should not be any uplift happening nor the sliding of the structure as a whole is happening so this stability aspect uh, you must have studied in rcc maybe in topics uh, related to uh, retaining walls and things like that so we have the sway stability also the whole structure including the portions between the expansion joints shall be adequately stiff against sway so it is not undergoing sway or even too much of sway otherwise the stability is always be questionable and satisfying the sway stability is also an important thing especially in industrial buildings so we need to ensure the safety against fatigue also so this uh, factor i have discussed uh, in the different types of loads under the special load is 875 part 4 i discussed uh, many of these things generally fatigue need not be considered unless a structure or element is subjected to numerous significant fluctuations of stresses so this is where the reversal of stress comes into picture or the reversal of load comes into picture especially with respect to wind or with respect to seismic so we have this effect of recycled loads the numerous cycling effect of the loads comes into picture then that leads to fatigue stress changes due to fluctuations in the wind leading normally need not be considered stress changes due to fluctuations in wind loading normally need not be considered gamma f equal to wind t shall be used for the load causing stress fluctuations and the stress range then finally plastic collapse plastic analysis and design may be used if the requirements specified under the plastic method of analysis are satisfied so many of the things what i discussed is applicable to the state method of design and of course applicable to working stress method of design also but in plastic analysis so we have to be a bit careful but as a part of this chapter so what i am going to discuss in the subsequent classes is the introduction to plastic method of analysis and of course uh, some analysis and design as a part of simple beam and few continuous beams also let us see what this limit state of serviceability is all about so we have discussed the limit state of collapse let us see the limit state of serviceability so as far as the limit state of serviceability is concerned so we have the following uh, four effects deflection limit vibration limit durability consideration and fire resistance as you know the serviceability limit state is the limit state beyond which service criteria are no longer met what service criteria specific service criteria specific to deflection specific to vibration or it is specific to durability or even the fire resistance so there are only four serviceability limit states considered as a part of the steel design but you have seen a similar type of uh, serviceability limit state in rcc also so serviceability limit state with respect to deflection and of course with respect to cracking we have seen in rcc but here we have four serviceability limit states now if you take uh, the deflection and of course uh, in an industrial building we have uh, different members horizontal members vertical members members acting as beams generally they are the horizontal elements we also have the columns generally the vertical elements so we have the roof trusses elements of the roof trusses portal frame and we also have the claddings cladded structure uncladded structure of course we have the elastic cladding brittle cladding many many such things comes into picture it can be a simply supported beam cantilever beam so various types of structures and structural components comes into picture as far as the determination of the deflection is concerned so what type of element you are looking for from the point of deflection calculation is the question to be asked and also you need to ask for what design load you are determining the deflection and of course in all the cases dead load is obviously be there so in addition to dead load what other loads are considered so that is where the combinations of the loads comes into picture now if you see the first column in this table it is a design load so i have put the live load or the wind load of course dead load is always be there so if you are determining the deflection of the purlin 
as a beam or as a flexural member or a grit again a grit is a sort of flexural member if you want to know what is a deflection calculate that particular deflection as a value based on a theory and that deflection should be well within the limiting value so what is the limiting value the limiting value as far as uh, this combination is concerned for this purlins or grits is span divided by 150 what is the condition supporting condition the supporting condition is such that it is a elastic cladding the building is having cladding but of course it should be a elastic cladding where the cladding is not pushed to the plastic condition so that is the level of the wind load or the level of the live load and what type of building you are considering as far as the purlin or the grit is concerned it is the industrial building so kindly see this industrial building is what the type of the building and what deflection you are looking for is it the vertical deflection or the horizontal deflection it is basically the vertical deflection so what is the vertical deflection in an industrial building where the industrial building is having a component say purlin where the building is having a cladding which is behaving in an elastic manner so the deflection we have already calculated based on the span type of load and the end conditions so we have the formula available so we have a value say 2 mm of deflection being calculated and that deflection should be less than the limiting value or the maximum value of the deflection specified and that value is span by 150 if this fan is say 1.5 meter so it is 1.5 meter into 1000 so that need to be divided by 150 so 1.5 mm is the maximum value of the deflection but as per the calculation it may be 1 mm so 1 mm less than 1.5 mm so that the design is safe by chance the actual value is 2 mm which is more than span by 150 say 1.5 mm then the structure fails by limiting deflection the purlin in this particular case will have the excess deflection more than the maximum value so it is not able to perform the intended function satisfactorily so in such cases we need to select a higher section for the purlin depending on what type of section we have selected from the point of limit state of collapse it may be okay but now you need to go for slightly a higher section where that higher section has a deflection which is less than the maximum value span by 150. Now if the supporting element is a brittle cladding then the allowable deflection is spanned by 150. So the limiting value is reduced because 180 comes in the denominator. So what is the difference between the elastic cladding and the brittle cladding requirement so in an elastic cladding a slightly a higher deflection is permitted whereas in case of a brittle cladding slightly a lesser limiting value is permitted so that is where 150 in the denominator and 180 in the denominator comes into picture now you please take the combination of dead load and live load in fact it is a combination of the live load only in all the cases it is live load of the industrial building where I am looking for the vertical deflection but if I am calculating the deflection of a simple span simply supported span element where the cladding is elastic in nature it is uh, span by 250 sorry span by 240 if it is a brittle cladding it is span by 300 where the limiting value is slightly less if it is a cantilever span if it is an elastic cladding it is spanned by 120 otherwise if it becomes a brutal cladding it is spanned by 150 so what is important is if you consider the elastic cladding requirement slightly a higher value of the deflection can be permitted as the limiting value otherwise in case of a brutal cladding so the maximum deflection permitted is slightly less compared to the situation of a elastic cladding and also the vertical deflection what you calculate depends on the type of the member whether it is a flexural member in the form of a purlin or a simply supported element or a cantilever element and it also depends on what is the type of the building all these things are valid only for the industrial buildings so we can also see the other buildings of course uh, so this is uh, the continuation of the industrial building only but there is a provision for the crane load in an industrial building so that is where uh, the rafter supporting the gantry comes into picture 
and of course uh, the profiled metal sheeting or a plastered sheeting comes into picture in the building and when you are determining the deflection of the crane or the gantry then it is considered as span by 500. When you have the other combinations, when you have the electrically operated crane, so where it is going up to 50 tons and the span by 750 is considered and if the capacity of the crane, if it exceeds 50 ton, then it is span by 1000. So why I have presented this information is because in the next semester, so you have to design the gantry girder and as a part of the project, sometimes you may have to even design the crane bridge in such cases what is the deflection that is permitted so that is given by these formulas of course we also have uh, other buildings other than the industrial building we have the conventional buildings and what is the allowable value the maximum value as far as the limiting deflection is concerned you will be able to get it from the uh, code itself is 800 so we also need to check for the vibrational effect Suitable provisions in the design shall be made for the dynamic effects of the live loads, impact loads and the vibration due to machinery, machinery operating loads and in severe cases possibility of resonance, fatigue or unacceptable vibration shall be investigated. Of course, we have a lot of uh, specifications available in IS 800. Anyway, we are not considering the problems uh, coming under this uh, category of vibration. But definitely when you look into practical problems or maybe as a part of your assignment or even projects. So you may have to look into this vibration as well. Of course, durability plays a very important role whether it is a RCC structure or even if it is a steel structure. So what are the factors that will have an influence on the durability? So what is durability when the structure is really performing all the intended function without undergoing uh, any effect over the design time of uh, 50 years, then we say the structure is really performing in a durable manner. What are the factors uh, which makes uh, the structure not to have the expected level of durability? It is generally the environmental factors, the degree of exposure, the shape of the member and the structural detail, the protective measures, whether the steel is really protected by providing a coating or not, Ease of maintenance, so these are the some factors, some of the factors being discussed in IS 800 2007 and many a times we need to look for special literatures from the international courts of practices or from the research documents so that we can get an insight into what these factors are and how these factors are really causing a problem against the durability and all those factors are need to be addressed while analyzing and designing the structure. Of course, uh, today the uh, accident because of fire is also quite common and how this uh, fire is uh, calculated, the fire load, many of the things I just uh, gave an introduction uh, as far as uh, the part 4 under the special load is concerned. So we can also look into international codes of practices as far as fire resistance is concerned. So fire resistance of a steel member is a function of its mass, its geometry the action to which it is subjected to, its structural support condition, fire protection measures adopted and the fire to which it is exposed. So this itself is a subject, uh, so it is very difficult to uh, give the introduction to the students at this level. So maybe over a time, uh, so if time comes into picture, so you can definitely explore by looking to some good textbooks and also the literature related to fire resistance. Design provisions to resist fire are briefly discussed in separate section in IS 800 2007. Please go to the appendix at the end of the uh, book where certain provisions uh, with respect to fire resistance is discussed. Specialist literature may be referred to for more detailed information in design of fire resistance of steel structures. Now let us uh, introduce to the statistical value. So in fact, uh, I was uh, mentioning about uh, uh, the characteristic uh, strength of the material. So what this characteristic strength you have seen and how this characteristic strength can be 
actually calculated from a given set of uh, data that means uh, the values of either the strength or the load so we need to have the average average of all those values we need to calculate the standard deviation sigma coefficient of variation mu that also comes into picture so these are all the values you must have uh, determined in your uh, statistics as a part of uh, given number of data but as I mentioned here, we need to go for the large sample analysis. The minimum number of data to be considered is uh, 30. And with that data, if you really want to calculate the average design strength of steel, so it is calculated using the following formula. So we have the minimum strength amongst the 30 values, what you get it from testing. What is the minimum value? That minimum value plus the statistical constant that need to be calculated that is uh, referred to as k based on certain assumptions into standard deviation. The standard deviation can be calculated from the set of data. So thereby the design strength SDV becomes S minimum. What is the minimum strength uh, in the set of uh, 30 values or 40 values plus k the statistical value. I will tell you about this in the next slide and the standard deviation calculated. We can also calculate the characteristic strength. As far as steel is concerned, it is a characteristic yield strength. So this characteristic yield strength is nothing but the mean strength, what we have calculated based on the data, minus k times the standard deviation. So standard deviation is also calculated, mean strength is also calculated. What is important is to identify the value of k, which is called as the statistical constant or the statistical parameter. So that statistical parameter we will be able to see in the next slide. So what is this uh, statistical parameter k? It is called as the Hemsworth constant or just the statistical value or the parameter. What percentage of results allowed to fall below the minimum? The probability of failure. What probability of failure we have considered in the analysis? As far as the limit state method of analysis is concerned, as far as strength is concerned, the probability what we have considered is 5%. So that is where phi, which I have shown in red color, comes into picture. So it can be even 0.1%. Kindly say here it is a percentage 0 0.6, 1%, 2.5%, 5%, 6.6%, 16%. So how much of probability of the failure that is permitted? So only 5% probability of failure is permitted as per as limit state limit state design is concerned as far as our Indian standard codes are concerned. The factor is 1.64. If you allow 5% probability of failure, so the value of k is 1.64 and if you allow higher value, then the value of k decreases. Higher the probability of failure, higher than 5, more than 5, then the value of k will be substantially reduced. But if the probability of failure is uh, reduced to 2.5, the value of k is 1.96. If the probability of failure is just 0.1%, strictly speaking, there is no failure. If that is what the situation, the value of k is considered as 3.09. So with that value of k, so we need to calculate the characteristic value. So I request the students to consider all these things in one particular calculation taking a set of data and then start to appreciate what exactly the importance of probability and why this 5% probability with a statistical parameter of 1.64 comes into pitch. So same uh, 1.65 where the probability is uh, 5% so that is where 1 in 20 comes into pitch. So if you have 20 samples tested so probably one sample can deviate. So not satisfying the required uh, uh, requirement. So thereby one sample is uh, undergoing the deviation or the failure. If that is what the situation of a 5% probability, the K is 1.65. So I have just uh, taken one simple example. So let me complete this in another 3-4 uh, minutes. So you need to take minimum of uh, 30 samples, but I have considered uh, only 10 samples. So this is uh, what the value of yield strength you get from uh, uh, strength of material laboratory by testing a steel sample so 249 254 257 256 240 so all these are all the values what you get it by taking 30 different samples but here only 10 sample results are presented 
So here you need to look for the minimum value. So amongst the value what I got in, in testing, 240 megapascal happens to be the minimum strength, the so called the minimum strength from the given sample of 10 or it could be 30. So summation of all these things I have written here. So what is the mean? So mean we have to calculate. So this value divided by 10 because I have taken 10 samples. Obviously 251.9 is a mean value. So if you subtract all these values individually from the mean value. So you are going to get the difference or the deviation. And of course you need to calculate the square of the deviation. So these types of problems we have exercised in your uh, mathematics in statistics. So the deviation values are like 2.95, 2.55 and you have to square it. And finally you need to calculate what is the sum of the square of the deviations of all the 30 samples. Well, I have taken only 10 for explanation. So with this the square of deviation and also calculating the mean, how the standard deviation is calculated. So the average strength as you know, so this summation, so divided by 10 it is 251.95. What is standard deviation? It is the root mean square deviation. So this is the square of the deviation. So square of the deviation is uh, here. Kindly see square of the deviation. And of course what is the mean? So it is uh, number of samples. So when you want to calculate the deviation, standard deviation, you can calculate as a function of n or even as n minus 1. So let us not discuss why it is n or n minus 1. So it is a concept of n minus 1. So under the root, so it is a deviation by n minus 1. So you are getting 5.712. So 5.712 is the standard deviation. And what is the coefficient of variation? So standard deviation divided by the average strength. The standard deviation is 2.712 which I have put it here. And what is this average strength? The average strength also 251.95. And into 100 because I need the percentage, it is 2.267. So 2.267 is the coefficient of variation. So with this, so you can calculate the average design yield strength. So average design yield strength is uh, just for our requirement we are calculating, but that is not the value we use it in limit state method. Just to have some information, so the average yield strength is nothing but the minimum strength amongst the 30 samples. So kindly see here. In 10 samples, the minimum is uh, 240 and that 240 plus the value 1.64, the statistical value for 5% probability and 5.712, the value which you have calculated as a standard deviation here, with this it is 249. So 249 megapascal is the average design strength uh, based on 30 samples, but I have presented only 10 results. But what is characteristic strength that is to be used in the design? The characteristic yield strength is nothing but so this mean value so 251.95 minus the statistical value of 1.64 into the standard deviation which you have calculated. So with this 242.58 MPA comes into picture. So this is what the value we need to use it in design and later this strength has to be reduced to take care of the uncertainties where 241.58 need to be divided by a factor. If it is uh, the yielding case, 242.58 divided by 1.1 comes into picture and that is what the actual design strength to be used in the design. What is the importance of this characteristic yield strength? I told you that this characteristic yield strength is that strength below which not more than 5% of the test results are expected to fall. How many samples we have considered here? We have considered uh, 10 samples but otherwise minimum 30, 40 we have to take it. But what is 1% of 10? It is 1. What is 1% of 5% of 10? It is hardly half sample. That can be rounded off to 1 sample. Say, what is the meaning? So 242.58 and below that you should not have more than 5% of the sample. Means if at all there is any value in the table there should be only off sample means just one sample can have a strength which is less than 242 but otherwise all other strengths should be more than 242. So let us go back to the table kindly say the values of the strength for all the sample is definitely more than 242 but there is only one sample whose strength is less than 242. So that is where 
characteristic strength is the strength below which not more than 5%. Now here it is less than 5%. So means uh, there is only one sample which is uh, less than this characteristic strength. So that is the implication of the meaning characteristic strength of steel. So at this stage uh, I will be stopping. So let us uh, discuss further in the next class. Now if students have any questions so they can ask. Thank you very much and wish you all the best.